welcome to Bank in the Future, brought to you in partnership with Nigeria's Union Bank. I am Wale Famirewa, and thank you for joining us. In the first of a series of panel conversations about the future of financial products and services, we bring you a very insightful panel conversation on the financial supermarkets of today and tomorrow. How is technology changing the game for not just financial service providers, but also for the consumer? Let's now head straight into that very insightful panel conversation. On today's program, we try to answer some questions about the financial supermarkets of today and the future. What is shaping the way consumers buy financial products? How is technology impacting how products are designed and consumed? And what's the role of regulators in the changing financial landscape? Joining me to address these issues is a great panel of operators in Nigeria's financial sector. Tai Oviosu is the CEO of the fintech company and mobile money provider, Paga. Kola Oni is the head of strategy, marketing, and planning at AXA Mansard. And Lola Cardoso is the head group corporate strategy at Union Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So I want to start with you and just maybe you can help us appreciate what is shaping the landscape right now and how financial products are created and consumed. A lot is, is said about technology that it's really the game changer. We've seen the proliferation of financial products and everyone from the affluent to everybody else down the line is able to buy a financial product today. So give us your thoughts on what is really changing the game today. First of all, well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, technology definitely is a big enabler and what we're seeing is that it is helping you to be able to get, using digital platforms, to be able to get access to everyone who has any internet connected device and at the most basic level most people connect through their mobile phones yeah um, and whether you have data on the phone or not as long as you have even ussd connectivity you can actually access a financial service so what we're seeing is around the world and definitely in nigeria we're already seeing this come to play where banks and other financial service providers such as paga are leveraging technology to reach the mass market yeah. now what we're also seeing, which is interesting for me when I think about it, is that even though you have the digital platforms that allow you to offer a service to the, to the mass market, you still need a physical interaction of some sort. Yeah. People need to be educated, people need to understand the products, and while cash is still available, people need to cash in and cash out into whatever the digital financial product is. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that creates a need for what I call an agent network, which yeah. I think we'll talk about just sort of the challenge that banks have in terms of building brick and mortar and the cost of that. And the way we are going after the business is saying that we're building a distribution network for financial services that we will leverage and we will also open up to other financial institutions. In fact, the two institutions here today are two of those that we, we hope to open up to. Um, to leverage our distribution network for the distribution of their own digital products mm. as well. All right. So I think it's um, technology is really helping to reach the mass market and lower the cost of mm. servicing. Mm. Colin, give us your perspective. And Mansard is obviously distributing insurance products, pension products, and other um, investment products. So yeah. give us your experience in terms of how the landscape is changing. Okay, um, thanks a lot, uh, Wally. Uh, I think the first thing I would like to say is that because we are in a unique position, we do not just offer one service. We have a pensions business, an asset management business, and an insurance and health insurance. Uh, we've noticed that uh, there is a convergence, uh, definitely, among our financial services providers. Uh, we, what we think is that in the future, uh, this convergence is going to lead to a situation whereby uh, customers really do not care whether you call yourself a bank or you call yourself an asset management company. What they really want is the ability to have access to their money yeah. as quickly as possible, make the payments uh, they need to make as quickly as possible. And you may not actually be able to differentiate between uh, an e-commerce company or a bank uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, as much as possible, we're trying to position our business in that way uh, uh, because that convergence is definitely going to come. Lola, well, tell us the experience of the traditional bank. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that is changing. Mm -hmm. It's 
been a story of brick and mortar, but with technology these days, it goes way beyond that. Uh, yes, it does. Um, thanks again for, for having, uh, having me on the program. Um, I, I think, as already previously said, um, what we've seen in the case of Union Bank is exactly that. Um, technology, in many cases, um, has been disruptive. Um, we've talked about, um, really, at the center of it is customers. And if customers demand control, want access, and also want convenience, um, then in many cases, when you talk about brick and mortar, um, you expect that to be less important in certain cases um, relative to some of the simple transactions that a customer will want to do. So whether it's you know, relying on bank statements and having to go in to go ask for a bank statement, instead there are a lot of things that you expect your mobile phone or internet to be able to do. Um, I think the fact that a lot of people want to be able to transfer money, know that it got there at the time they transferred tells you that even the quick time demand for information and knowing that they have the control to hit a button and send yeah. completely then says, you know, to what extent then, what role do your branches and your physical infrastructure have to play? Um, I think Tyro spoke about this a moment ago. Yes, they, they will have your physical brick and mortar have a role to play. The question is how they fit in. And, you know, in an earlier stage, we talked about multi-channel where you would have internet, you would have your mobile, yeah. you would have branches. Now the conversation is about omni channel so it means that if I start a transaction in one in one sphere if you will of technology then I should be able to finish and it should be very seamless so I'm the same Lola whether I'm in internet or mobile or I happen to finish my transaction in the branch because it's more complex mm -hmm. um, the fact is it's omni-channel and really that's where traditional banks if you will are headed or you know, I shouldn't even say are headed are already there yeah. the question is when you think about the internet of things and to the conversation around are you a bank or not are you just a solutions provider I think many banks today are thinking of themselves as solution providers. And mm -hmm. therefore, as a customer, um, it's not a question of whether I can get a savings account or a current account. It's whether I can get that convenience, whether I have access to my data, control, and trust. And as long as you can provide those things while meeting their core demands as far as financial, um, then I think right. that's a given. I think, Lola, you made an interesting point, And actually, I think you asked the question, are you a bank or not? And that is that is perhaps less relevant in the future and maybe mm -hmm. I would like both of you to reflect on that, maybe starting with Tayo. Mm -hmm. How should the financial service provider of today think about the customer? Well, on the question of are you a bank or not, it's a, it's a real good one because when I look at Paga as an example, yeah. right, your Paga account has a 10-digit Nuban account number, which all bank accounts in Nigeria have. Mm -hmm. Um, the way you transfer money from Union Bank to Zenith Bank is exactly how you transfer money from Union Bank to Paga, exactly the same way. Um, and it runs in the same rails, same infrastructure, and you can transfer from Paga to Union Bank in exactly the same way. Uh, before the end of this well, year- Paga is not a bank. By the, before the end of this year, you'll have a debit card tied to the Paga account. Wow. Uh, hopefully before the end of this year, you'll be able to get interest on that Paga account. Central Bank is looking at this regulation. Mm. Um, but we're not a bank, mm. right? We're not a deposit-taking institution from a legal regulatory point of view. But from the customer's point of view, it smells like a bank. Right. It smell, you know, so it's you know, so what's the difference? Yeah. And and I would argue actually that for a certain segment of the market, there is no difference. Mm -hmm. um, and for a different segment, such as those who are already banked today, like I'm banked with multiple banks, Panga is not going to replace my bank for me. It's going to be a complement to my bank. Mm -hmm. I'll be able to save my bank accounts in my Paga wallet, save my cards, and use my Paga wallet when, whenever I want to from whichever bank I want or cash in Paga. While for the person who's unbanked, who has that convenience and access to our agents, Paga will look like their bank, right? And, and behind that, we'll work with different financial institutions to offer products to, to that customer. Um, so, but again, it's, I think it is about the customer view rather than the name, and which is, you know, a, a view that we've always had that people just want a service. And, and so I really agree with the point that they don't care what it's called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, knowing it's regulated allows them to have a degree of confidence mm -hmm. and trust, uh, but they don't care what it's the label. Is. We'll certainly get to the point about regulation and how important that is in, in terms of building confidence and trust in the system. Mm -hmm. But do you want to share your perspective on the points that? Um, just made. Yes, uh, d definitely. Um, it's about the convergence uh, because um, as a bank or probably even as an asset management company, which is one of the services we provide, yeah. uh, the, the, there are certain differences between the way those services are offered at the moment. Uh, as an asset management company, we probably do not have a card 
But if you can imagine a situation whereby we actually start issuing cards to our customers, uh, then you have a business model uh, that essentially alters the banking landscape. And as he said, uh, customers are now very, very brand agnostic and they simply just want to have access to their money. Uh, I have a service uh, on my phone whereby I can actually use artificial intelligence to transfer money from my bank account to any other bank. I simply link my card to this artificial intelligence and I transfer money to every bank. And interestingly, it is cheaper than what the banks are paying. So as far as I'm concerned, that is now my bank. Uh, if you also look at the business model of the banks and the asset management companies, banks are not built to transfer their profits to their customers. Uh, more or less, banks are not built to transfer all the returns on your deposits to the customer because they have certain charges linked to liquidity and solvency. But if you look at an asset management company, their business model is built to transfer all your returns to you yeah. with a little bit of a charge. So you see opportunities for, uh, for changes, for this convergence, for this harmonization uh, as you look at the structure of the industry. And consumers are beginning to note that. And this is fueling this, uh, this convergence right. that we're talking about. But you spoke of convergence, and I want you to speak to this point about not just convergence of services, but convergence of companies, companies working together, providers of mm -hmm. different services. Mm -hmm. Because I think everyone will have a strength. Mm -hmm. So the traditional bank, obviously, perhaps is the best at managing cash, mm -hmm. um, several other things they can do that perhaps the others can't. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the flip side, you have an asset manager who, who has built a competence in a certain area. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you are still trying to serve the same consumer. Mm -hmm. So your perspective on the convergence that needs to happen there. Yeah, it's very critical. I mean, there are many conversations we have uh, today, both within Union Bank and even external. I think uh, uh, Tyre referred to some of this, but we, there is no way we think about the future of banking and even consumers where you can uh, talk about the future without partnerships. It is very critical. Um, in many parts of the world today, they're talking about open APIs and recognizing that as much as you might have a mobile platform or whatever digital platform, because you're dealing with different segments of customers and with different needs, mm -hmm. how do you bring all of that together? And oftentimes you have a core competency, um, but the way to bring it together is by by partnering. So even when you talk about a, an agent network and you think about you know bringing the unbanked into uh, into uh, sort of getting financial access. How do you do that? Because again, the, the, the constant tension between uh, physical infrastructure, leveraging technology, but also having the millions of people we have within Nigeria as an example, mm -hmm. how do you access? You can't do that without partnerships. So whether it's on the technology side, whether it's through networking, whether it's even through marketing, um, and even being able to reach different folks. Because you talk about today the internet of things, uh, people have mobile and all kinds of platforms, but people come to one stop to try to do a lot, right? And you ask this question around a traditional bank or not, and I listen to both uh, um, their conversations or their responses, and I think at the end of the day, it boils down to trust, right? So even at Union Bank, a lot of the conversations today is not about a bank. Yes, we're a bank in, in our entity and the fact that we're regulated, but how are we a trusted partner? So whether you are a corporate client or you're a retail customer, or you're a commercial, or you're in the community, how are we a trusted partner in whatever sphere of interaction that we have with right. you? And you spoke of regulation, and Tyra, I'd like you to, to think about this as you answer this next question. The telcos, mm -hmm. um, many will suggest that their revenues have plateaued. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the next big thing is for them to evolve into not just technology, uh, not just um, mobile technology companies, but technology companies that are enabling different things, including financial services. Mm -hmm. And your thoughts about the opportunity for that to happen, especially in Nigeria. Now, many have argued that one of the reasons why we haven't seen that evolution to a greater extent in Nigeria is regulation. Mm -hmm. Your perspective on this point? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of hype made about the importance of the opportunity for telcos in, in this business. And a lot of it comes from the fact that currently the most basic way people connect to services is through a mobile phone. Um, however, when you look around the world, the largest companies that have actually been very successful in driving financial services uh, broadly are not telcos. Um, and in fact, there's only maybe two examples that you could give that are really doing well on this across all the places. Kenya 
and and then you would maybe say uh, Zim, right, Zimbabwe. And in Zimbabwe, with all due respect to Equinet, I argue, is it because of Zimbabwe, right, and the situation in Zimbabwe that has made that successful. So I think, you know, it's really about Kenya where we've seen that really work well. Um, and they've not been able to replicate it in other places themselves. They've tried, but they've mm -hmm. not been able to, and there are real reasons why they've not been able to. So I actually think the regulation in Nigeria is sound when you look at other parts of the world. The key reason why there's a risk for the regulator to open this up to telcos is because you have you now have dual regulators regulating this particular sector, one. Two, you will now have four companies controlling you know, pretty much the communications of the country and the financial side of the country. That's a huge risk. Right. Um, in a dual regulated thing, it, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't advise on it, right? I'm biased, but I also wouldn't advise on it. So do I think we need the telcos in this business to actually achieve the vision? No, I don't think so. I think Nigeria is such a big country, it takes time to really get there. But I think what we do need is we need people to go out and do the hard work of building out this network of agents to do the hard work of thinking about the mass market and what kind of products they need. So we currently have 12,000 agents in Paga across 35 states. That is double the reach of all the banks put together, their bank branches, all of them, right? Um, and our plan is to grow that to about 200,000 over the next five years. So, but I don't even think that's enough for Nigeria. We need somebody else to come in and build, build more agents, right? Um, and we need to open that up to more. To, to other players, which is our, our, our goal. Mm. And when you do that, and then you leverage digital, and people put the right effort and right marketing behind it, you will see the success um, of people leveraging these services um, right. in the market. Okay, I wonder if you have some thoughts on this point. Would you agree totally with Tayo on this point about the place of telcos in, in the evolution that we're speaking of today? Um, I think, Partly, I agree with him. Uh, I agree with him uh, because uh, I also believe uh, that the distribution platform uh, that the telcos provide to us can actually be replicated by other players. Uh, but on the other hand, I also know that um, the payment structure that the telcos have in Nigeria uh, is a little bit expensive because they have this multi-layered view from uh, large merchants to the smaller merchants mm -hmm. before it gets to the man on the street. Mm -hmm. So using them uh, as, a, as a payment platform definitely has its own challenges and um, it will be good if we have options in that regard uh, and options that would even be much more viable if uh, other players can do the work and roll out their channels. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're talking about the financial supermarkets of the future and many will suggest that the largest institutions perhaps would be at the core of that. So we're talking about some of the banks and let's get your perspective on, on the evolution that you're seeing um, for product creation, um, consumer engagement, as technology is enabling this. Your, your thoughts on the role of banks and how that is likely to change? Um, I think the role of banks are, um, is, is quite critical when you think about uh, consumers and technology. Um, there are many things, right? You talk about uh, service uh, and how you uh, engage customers and not just engagement as far as getting them onboarded um, whether they're on bank today but even the types of products uh, and solutions that we offer um, you think about things that are as basic as um, today paying school fees and where we're coming from where it's you know get a bank draft to check to now today you're doing transfers but there yeah. are many integrated solutions not just even from the customer end. so in two ends you have two customers you have the individuals who have to pay school fees, right? But you also have schools that have to, one, get school fees paid, but have to issue transcripts, et cetera. So a lot of the conversations today is how does technology provide the solution from a value chain perspective and a multiplier effect? And I think that those are the conversations that are being had today. It's no longer around a current account or um, uh, a savings account or, or just an LC. There are things around process efficiencies um, and where technology plays, but the customer engagement on all angles of that value chain is what is critical and making sure that as a bank or as a partner, you're actually working through that value chain to make sure that everybody gets the efficiencies and um, uh, the benefits that they expect. Well, if you can simplify this for us, so for the small business, owner for the individual mm -hmm. how how is the bank engaging that person today maybe you can simplify that using an example for us 
So today, typically, and again, depending on where you are, but even as a small business owner, a lot of the conversations are beyond a product, i.e. how you collect money or how you open an account to save money. There's a whole conversation around who are your, who are your customers, how do you receive payments in, um, how do you get payments out? So the whole notion of managing, I don't want to call it working capital, but again, how do you leverage technology in a suite to be able to manage ins and outs? Mm. But there's the other piece around value add, which then talks about marketing. How do you then get a, a small business to be plugged in, right, into different networks? And so we talk about even access. So beyond financial access, there's a conversation around market access and how do you give them exposure? So if I'm an SME within Lagos, how do you get them market access to other parts of Nigeria? Because mm. guess what, there are customers on the other end of the Lagos border. How do you have those conversations and plugging them in, whether it's through the Union Bank network, um, through the partners that we talked about a moment ago as far as convergence, but again, leveraging technology, because it's all an issue of um, access, convenience, and being able to see and protect your money. So those are the conversations we're having um, today, but they're, you know, they're, in many ways, the conversations are a web of conversations, right? So when you even talk about a small, uh, an SME, or you talk about an individual, even a corporate account, it's the same notion. If I have distributors, how do I understand what each of my distributors are doing? How do I know when they need a little bit more product or not? So there's a whole notion even of inventory management and building those types of solutions mm -hmm. that ordinarily a bank may not, but a trusted partner would. Right. Um, Tyler, disruption has become a very sexy word today. So things like Uber um, have shown us what can happen when you come with technology and you want to change the game. What game changing um, initiatives do you anticipate are either we are on the cusp of seeing that happen or are already happening and we, we just don't see it yet? Within financial services. I Within think. financial okay. services. So, I mean, look, I think the democratization of access is going to hit us with a big wave. We, we see it's coming, but I don't think people on, you know, are really understanding it yet because it's going to come and it's going to come very quickly. And what would be the um, implication of this? The, the implication is that you're going to have, you, we're going to significantly see more people into the formal financial services sector. And we're going to actually now start realizing, you know, cashless Nigeria, right? Um, not because it was forced on Nigeria by some edict um, of the central bank, but because people are starting to just adopt, adopt services and people are comfortable. Um, I don't think the, there's an issue of trust. I mean, people need to trust who they're, they're, who they're offering. But I think, so if I take our service as an example, I think people are not are first trusting the PAGA agent, who is someone in their community, who they've known for years, and who's not moving, right? Um, and they've gone there now for four years and done services at that person. To make that next step of actually doing things by themselves is not going to be a big leap because that's the person who's selling it to them, right? So now moving into a financial product that they actually have access to on their mobile phone or going to that agent to access a loan product or an asset management product, right, um, is not going to be a big leap for them because they're talking again to someone who they already trust um, and who's driving it uh, on their behalf. And so what you're going to end up seeing very quickly, I think, is people using the services, not just as an agent, but by themselves. And once that starts happening, you're going to now see people going into locations and paying from that, that mobile wallet, mm -hmm. right, and doing transactions that way. So Absolutely. you're going to see that start happening. Someone made a very interesting comment once that there are actually places in Nigeria where people actually gather to give their cash to someone so that they can help them transfer it somewhere mm -hmm. else. Yeah, so and that's what our agents do. <laughs> that's what, that's what that's you do at our agents. Right. So you can go to a PAGA agent and give them cash and they can send it to any, mm -hmm. any phone number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The recipient either picks up at an ATM without a card mm -hmm. or at another agent. You can send to any bank account instantly. You can withdraw from bank accounts at our agents. Mm -hmm. And you can pay for electricity, a television, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, so that's exactly what's already happening at mm -hmm. the agents. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're financial, a place of financial access. So the next step now is allowing the agents, people to go to the agents to open savings accounts, to open, to get access to a loan product, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, in the next quarter, we're a partner with, with a bank, I can't announce now, but in the next quarter, we'll go live with this, where you can actually go to a PAGA agent and apply for a loan. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and you now get access to the loan in your wallet, and you can perform transactions directly right. from your wallet, or you can cash it out, etc. Interesting point. And I think in the investment management space, a lot can happen there because now we have a situation where 
um, products, savings products, could potentially be very disruptive for the banks. Now, we know the banks like their current accounts <laughs> because it's cheap. But then, is, is it about time that banks begin to realize that, listen, as more people get educated about investing and financial planning and financial solutions, it's only a matter of time for those deposits to simply move into one type of investment vehicle mm -hmm. or the other? Yes, uh, definitely. You know, if you look back, you would realize that uh, companies typically, they compete uh, primarily based on access, mm -hmm. uh, which is that distribution platform in certain instances, or direct access to certain customer types or probably within a particular country. Uh, the second major factor is the sort of regulatory environment they have, which enforces uh, certain capital requirements on them. Uh, we've noticed that these distribution platforms are collapsing, and as they collapse, uh, companies who held onto them in the past, they are losing uh, those advantages. So if you are competing before, uh, keeping current accounts primarily because you are the only bank in the village, uh, that is changing uh, rapidly. And because it is changing, uh, everybody is customizing things. Uh, that's why there is no difference between savings uh, and current accounts anymore, uh, just as she alluded to, uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you put all these things uh, into play, uh, you would notice that we're getting to a situation whereby you would probably just have a mono product. Uh, you don't need a savings account somewhere or an asset management account somewhere, mm -hmm. but you just have a place where you have your money. Mm -hmm. And that same place gives you access to uh, pay, gives you access to earn returns mm -hmm. on your investments. And this is the approach that we're using uh, even in pr formulating new products. Uh, just last year, there was a package, a campaign that we rolled out for some, one of our products, whereby what we really try to do is to make it as flexible as possible uh, for the, uh, you know, for the for the consumer, and you have instances whereby life insurance products and mm -hmm. savings products that were previously bundled mm -hmm. or sold separately, mm -hmm. uh, you bring them together and you basically give the customer the flexibility to choose that in this particular product, how much of a savings product do I want it to be, or how much of a life insurance product do I want it to be. Yeah, you understand? Mm -hmm. Do I want to increase my premium? Uh, do I want to increase my life insurance cover? and get less from my savings, or do I want to reduce my life insurance and get more from savings, but it's still the same product. You are not bundling it into five or six you know, uh, other different products because the customer just wants you know, uh, to be served. In the same way. When I think of disruption in financial services space, I actually feel like the banks are the, <laughs> are the ones that are likely to bear the brunt. But let's hear from Lola in terms of how the banks are, are adjusting to the new normal. So, for instance, as we've just spoken about, mm -hmm. those current account deposits are no longer safe. Mm -hmm. And I've been speaking to some uh, bankers, and there is now this talk about transactional banking, mm -hmm. where perhaps that is the new revenue mm -hmm. generator that mm -hmm. would compensate for mm -hmm. whatever loss, losses you make mm -hmm. from the fact that people simply can can invest in anything today. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? I mean, I think uh, you're, you're spot on. Um, I think a lot of the conversations we, we have in the, the hallways at Union Bank is both solution and certainly transaction, right? Yeah. Um, the notion is, again, you're expecting that as economic activity happens, as you talk about SMEs, you talk about individuals, it's always transaction-based. Um, and so there's a lot of conversation around um, payments and collections. How do you ease that, the speed of a, speed of a transaction? Um, how do you do it at a lower cost? And which is why technology comes in, because the only way you can have efficient transaction processing and banking and acknowledgement and reconciliation is having a solution package when you talk about transactions. That's one end. The other piece, and we talked about mobile, but I think one thing to be, when we think about the future of banking, there's also an acknowledgement of the different segments and thresholds, right, within the Nigerian um, uh, environment. And so when you talk about the, the sort of a higher end or segment, you can talk about things like life insurance, et cetera, but there are folks today we're talking about that are underbanked and for which you're saying, how do we reach them through a, an agent network? You're trying to bring them in to even help them understand about savings and being able to make small transactions. Then there are folks who today are have a couple accounts and you're saying, how do I use my part of money, whether from an investment perspective, or how do I use that same money to buy tickets, groceries, many different things without having to go through the 
the tedious effort of having to do transfers because things are automatically recurring expenses. How do you make that easy for them using the different digital platforms? So I think there are different spheres of how technology will impact. It's a question of you know, when they come into that, uh, into that cycle, if you will, and, and then evolve over time. Um, but yes, on the commercial side, when you talk about SMEs, commercial, corporate business clients, it's clearly about transactional banking uh, for banks, but it's also about the value add. So I talked about that whole value chain effort. Sure. That's where it is. Very useful points. And we have to take a break now. We'll take a short break and continue our discussion on the financial supermarkets of today and the future. We're back in a moment. back to this special panel discussion on financial products. My guests are Tayo Viosu, CEO of Paga. Kola Oni is the Head of Strategy, Marketing and Planning at AXA Mansard. And Lola Cardoso is the Head Group Corporate Strategy at Union Bank. Tayo, thanks so much for staying with us. And I want to come back to you and talk about the, the array of consumers that we're now engaging with technology. You know, as we're talking about the future, Obviously, the bottom of the pyramid is become, has become a very big area that people are focusing on. So speak to how that is changing. And I know that it's not, a business it shouldn't be altruistic, right? Mm. They should be responsible. Sure. But how is that a profitable segment to deal with? Yeah. So first of all, in terms of the, the addressable market, with technology, you are able to now address pretty much everyone and give different types of offerings. So for example, um, you may have a USSD offering where, which works off a string like star 242 hash on your mobile phone that is accessible to someone without a smartphone. And so with the most basic phone, you can actually access financial services and that allows you to reach the base of the pyramid who may not have smartphones yet. Um, but the same set of services could now be offered on a very nice looking app that works on an iPad for the high net worth individual, yeah. but it's actually the same services. And so technology allows you to then be able to offer service to the same sets of people. And there'll be some things that you target slightly differently. But from a cost perspective, which is where you are going, um, here, the way I think about it today is that things are, unfortunately, will still be expensive for a little while for the, for the base of the pyramid. But as more services come, as competition comes in, then prices will go down. And I think that's just the way it would naturally work. The, the, what we've seen over the last year when I think of Nigeria's macro, and I've seen our numbers grow in terms of transactions, what people are looking at is they would rather go to a Paga agent and pay 150 Naira to do a transfer to a bank versus pay 200 Naira one way on a bus, right, and stand in traffic. So it would have cost them 400 Naira both ways, plus the time at the bank, they'd rather pay the 150. So when you look at the 150 versus how much they were, they're actually depositing, it seems expensive. But then when you compare it to the alternative, it actually isn't. Now, as, as things progress in the economy, as the cost of even that transportation goes down, the cost of the service will have to go down, right? So things over time, prices will, will shift down for the base of the pyramid. Kola, what type of evolution are we seeing in terms of the investment products space and the other financial service products beyond um, your typical banking type deposits and investment type inve and products. So things like insurance, which I know you're also invested in. Yeah, definitely we, uh, we are seeing the same thing in insurance. Um, just about three years ago, we partnered with one of the telcos uh, to launch a micro insurance product uh, in Nigeria. And uh, consumers, mostly people at the lower end of the pyramid, were actually able to use their phones uh, to purchase uh, life insurance. Now, uh, a few years back, that would have been impossible because when you look at the type of policies that were sold, we sold daily policies, uh, weekly policies, and monthly policies. And the administrative cost, uh, you know, of selling these sort of policies uh, using the former agent network was definitely prohibitive. And you needed the customers to buy at least a one-year product before you could sell to them. So this is definitely changing the way we are also reaching the consumers. And it speaks to the earlier point we made 
about the collapse of uh, distribution channels, uh, which was previously the exclusive preserve of certain organizations, and how that is fundamentally changing the way financial services products are being sold. Right. Um, Lola, how are the banks engaging the bottom of the pyramid? And strategically, how, where does that fit in for you? Um, the answer is yes. Um, there is uh, a strong conversation around uh, the unbanked or underbanked. Uh, we talk about financial literacy at the highest level because one, there's even the first acknowledgement of helping people understand uh, what it means to um, uh, to save, what it means from a retirement perspective, and that's really been the focus. So there's Union Bank has been very uh, progressive when it comes to. Um, increasing the literacy, whether it's from young all the way to old, when we think about financial literacy. But from the business end, because you talk about, um, obviously, not altruistic, but there's a big belief that, um, you know, it's, it's a volume game, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're able to get the channels we're talking about, and not again brick and mortar, but using the, the where we've invested in, cap, in, in uh, capital from a technology perspective, then it's a question of how you get them in, in fold, lower costs. Um, clearly, there, there's always pushback on charges, etc. But one thing we found um, in our experience in launching a few products like Union Day Day, Union Future, there's a great demand for savings products. And savings products that one gives them a pool of money over time. It's not um, over ambitious, or over zealous, they're able to put money aside for a period of time for which they get either significant interest or they get the ability to win prizes, etc. has been um, uh, uh, in hot demand. And we've seen that both in the north, so when we talk about some of the places in the north around Union Day Day, the, the demand for that product has been fantastic. Um, and it just says that they understand what it means to put money away and having that money in two, three years, whether it's to put aside for education or put aside to set up a business. But knowing that the money is kept, it's trusted, they can see you know, every day, every month that the money pool is increasing. It has been amazing. And so I think it's a combination of literacy, it's a combination of time, it's a combination of letting them see that the money is building up and there are no questions asked, there's no um, fees that are not transparent to them. Um, I think that's really where our focus has been in trying to get them into the fold. And remember my conversation around different segments. Once they're in the fold, then there's a different conversation around um, life insurance products and being able to save towards buying a car or getting access to credit. And all of these things are explained to them at an earlier start. I want us to begin to talk about the role of regulators and mm -hmm. you know the government in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in a forum where the head of the pension regulate pension industry regulator, mm -hmm. the Securities and Exchange Commission, mm -hmm. and the banking industry mm -hmm. were all mm -hmm. in the same room. And I was thinking, to what extent are these regulators working together mm -hmm. to ensure that we can enable the proliferation of financial services mm -hmm. and reaching the bottom of the pyramid? And maybe I speak with you, um, start with you, Kola. Um, your thoughts on how responsible regulators can be in trying to make this happen, and what what changes do you would you like to see? Um, okay, uh, I think the, the the biggest point is that regulators typically protect the interest of the public, uh, whether it's in banking or in insurance or any other type of uh, any other type of industry. Uh, now, regulators, uh, in a way, request for some sort of capital charge uh, in order to protect uh, the public. And investors typically uh, trade within those capital charges. So if you notice that the regulatory charge in a particular industry is probably prohibitive or too high, you will see investors move to another industry because they will get better returns on their investments. Uh, so uh, as, as, as service providers are converging, as they are customizing products, you would notice that some providers, because they are in a much more relaxed regulatory environment, uh, most operators would love to be licensed by them, and they're basically just providing services that other operators with a larger capital charge are also providing. So what would then need to happen is that regulators will need to come together and try to address the changes in the market with one voice. And so instead of you seeing Nikon regulating Axam and Side Insurance, CBN regulating the, the banks, things like that, you will see more collaboration, 
you would even throw NCC in uh, because as he said earlier, NCC was almost uh, going to the, of the, of the, the telecom, telecoms, telecoms because if we had done mobile money the way it was done in Kenya, for instance, you actually have um, the telecoms company controlling a large chunk of the liquidity of the of the economy, even though they were not being regulated by uh, by the by the Central Bank of, of Kenya. And of course, the Central Bank of Kenya was placing a lot of regulatory charges in terms of meeting certain liquidity and solvency ratios on the banks. And those requirements, uh, those things were not being placed on the telcos, which sort of give them an unfair advantage. So we would definitely see this convergence as, uh, as things so as we've on. seen convergence yes. of services, do we need a convergence of regulators now? Is there a case for that? Oh, there is definitely a case for more we, collaboration. We have that to a large extent yes. in the UK. So yes, definitely. Is, is, should that be the new normal because um, of the way financial services are, yeah. uh, are converging now? Yeah, what Axam Ansad has noticed is that uh, if you take banking and insurance, for instance, uh, if you go to Malaysia, I think, and Indonesia, you will see that there's actually only one regulator uh, for insurance and banking. And uh, that, in a way, has actually helped them to even foster uh, financial inclusion. Uh, so it's definitely uh, happening uh, uh, in our work. We've, we've, we've noticed that. And of course, uh, it can even grow wider. And you actually see them. Uh, you know, in the past few years, um, we've seen services that were previously regulated by one regulator uh, being moved to other regulators, like how we created Pencom mm -hmm. out of nowhere. Definitely there was someone regulating the pension business before in Nigeria. Uh, you see how we created the NHIS, which is a National Health Insurance Scheme. Definitely there was someone regulating that business before. Uh, we moved a little bit away from the trend that was happening globally. So I would not be surprised if at one time or the other we decide to also you know, reverse this uh, in line with all these things that are happening. So your views on this? Yeah, so well, actually, as, we, as we were talking about this, I was thinking about in the UK, I guess, my understanding of how it works there is you then ha you have the um, the authorities that develop the rules versus the, Execute. the executing yeah. of the regulator, yeah. right? Um, I mean, look, I think for now, where Nigeria is and this kind of things, I think we just need collaboration mm -hmm. and people talking. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and we've seen that with NCC and, and even though the telcos are not um, licensed to do this business, we've still seen collaboration with NCC yep. because That's we about. know that the mobile phone Excellent. is being used yeah. for right. these yep. transactions. Yep. So there's still a conversation that needs to be had mm -hmm. to make sure that the entity understands the business, understands mm -hmm. the frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know more collaboration with Pencom, with the insurance regulator, mm -hmm. to allow for uh, products that can go to the mass market mm -hmm. and to open their minds to those things um, is key and, yep. and, and is important. One of the things that we're seeing in our space, and I think this is gonna tie in with the asset managers, is right now the central bank is is looking into changing the regulatory framework for mobile payments and mobile money in Nigeria to allow mobile money companies to actually use the funds and invest it in treasury bills mm -hmm. so that we can in so turn in offer interest to our clients. And that money, what we've actually proposed as an industry, is that that money should be managed by an asset manager mm -hmm. who, who has that capability right. and experience. Um, and what again in treasury bills, which are safe mm -hmm. and to protect the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've just any thoughts on this point. Yeah, I, um, I certainly agree. I think collaboration is key. Um, I, I think in some ways, it doesn't matter whether the the regulatory body stand alone. It's a question of what's the implication um, of uh, a collaborating opinion. And I think even when you think about retail insurance and even the the discussion that's happening now, where a lot of banks ha are. Um, promoting and selling bank insurance products. They're doing this under the regulation of both NICOM and CBN and making sure that they can hold, um, you know, hold to, to both regulatory bodies, but again, given access to the customers. I do think, and this happens time and time again, whether you look back in history, but at some point when we evolve as um, regulatory bodies um, in the financial uh, sector in Nigeria or wherever, it's always a push and pull between the consumers and what they're demanding and access. And if we talk about some of our financial inclusion targets and talk about the economic develop, development we expect to see and hope to see, then you expect that there will at least at a minimum be the collaboration across the regulatory bodies. Um, and obviously with time, 
we, we expect those things to change. I would also briefly talk about venture financing or business financing. So mm. we're talking things like venture capital, private equity. I know, Qatar, you have a background there. So maybe I'll, let, uh, I'll allow you go first. Uh, your thoughts on how that is changing um, and how we need to begin to, to um, adapt to that uh, as an industry. I mean, we've been going now, Paga, for about eight years, and so I've seen a lot of change in <clears throat> access to venture capital um, and seed money. It's still very difficult. It's very difficult to raise money for private companies in Nigeria, but there's a lot more capital coming in. Um, I think we need the government to also step in to encourage it. This is one of the conversations we had at the Lagos at 50 two weeks ago now or so, um, where it was really about how do we... Um, you know, how does Lagos State encourage foreign direct investments? And we said, look, take a page out of Singapore, out of Israel, where the government said for everyone who brings in venture capital, we'll match it, um, you know, a dollar for every two dollars you bring in. Um, and you manage the money, right? Um, because what we have right now is it's very hard to find seed capital to get businesses started. And once you do, well, if you do find that, the next, next level is also very difficult. And there are a lot of opportunities, both in the financial sector we're talking about, but also just broadly across across Nigeria. There are a lot of low-hanging fruit, so to speak. And, there, and we're also seeing a lot more entrepreneurs. Um, I actually think we also need to encourage middle managers in most businesses to step out. Um, because you know across the world, what we've seen is the most successful entrepreneurs are in the mid-40s. And I think there's a reason for that. It's that they've actually worked, they've understood what it is to manage a P&L, to lead teams and to you know to drive an organization and that's what helps them. But, be but what's your view on the crowdfunding, you know, and how that is is going to be part of the future here? <laughs> I want you to make a point. I, I think that's still too early for here. Um, is, is sort of my, my sense yeah. of it. I think I think we still need first of all professional angels um, who are <clears throat> willing to not just put money but also advise the businesses with their experience. Yep. And then we need institutions to come in and do actual venture capital. Um, I think at the crowdfunding stage, you need the populace to have become a lot more mature in their thinking and the law to be a lot more clear about protecting. Now, a lot of um, companies who are venture backed here, a lot of the venture money is actually not in Nigeria, yeah. right? So if I take Paga as an example, we're incorporated at Mauritius mm -hmm. and that's where our venture funds go and then it comes into the Nigerian entity. Now, part of why investors are doing that is because the law here is not as sophisticated. So the law itself needs to change, right, to encourage in a, in a clearer way. And there needs to be rule of law, to be clear, right? So with our investors, God forbid anything happens, but they're protected because they know they're in a place where it's governed by the laws of England and Wales, and they're fine, you know. And right. so we need a lot of those things to change first before you can even go towards crowdfunding. All right. Uh, but let's talk a bit about something that could also be an issue for the banks here. I'm picking on the banks quite a bit. <laughs> but here's the thing. A lot of people complain about the high interest environment. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the banks aren't supporting small businesses mm -hmm. and so forth. So what's the smart thinking around that? So I imagine that venture capital begins to be an issue that people want to, to bring up as an alternative. But I just want you to speak to this point. How do we get that capital to the people that need it? Kola, mm -hmm. maybe you can... Okay. Um, definitely. Uh, I think the first thing I would like to say is that we need to see a common thread here, whereby previously people just had exclusive access to certain things, including funding, you understand, uh, and including uh, capital, uh, which is where this crowdfunding and venture, crowdfunding for, for ventures uh, actually comes in. And the way I see it is that uh, definitely it's something that is going to come. Uh, it's a sharing economy uh, right now. And as AXA man said, and as AXA globally, what we have actually projected is that uh, in about two decades, uh, most people will not have cars anymore. You will not need to have your own individual car because it will be so seamless. Uh, not only would most vehicles be driverless, it would also be quite seamless for you uh, actually to just share the best and the latest car with a right. friend and you just picked it up, that you know, at, at, at a port. <laughs> and it is actually going to come to, uh, come to Nigeria. So I think increasingly, uh, people in their private lives are beginning to use crowdfunding uh, 
to raise money for their education and, uh, and things like that, and it's happened in this country. Uh, so uh, definitely looking at that. So what we've done internally is to actually start latching onto these things. You would see us uh, partnering with a lot of companies that are already operating in the sharing economy. Uh, we have a partnership with, with uh, Uber, uh, for instance. We're looking at a number of startups in Nigeria who are uh, looking at coming up with solutions that are leveraging uh, on that trend, uh, you know. And uh, definitely, uh, we're also not closing our eyes to uh, opportunities to uh, look at startups or protect startups uh, who raise their money mm -hmm. through, uh, through uh, crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lola, your thoughts on this? I project? think my thought would be just having the right framework um, and having the awareness around, uh, I guess, on both sides. Um, because you, you, you talk when you talk about VC and you talk about whether it's startups or angel funding, um, I, in a lot of our conversations, and you know, Union Bank is 100 years, uh, we partnered and we're partnering with CC Hub in trying to, one, help um, uh, Organizations that are already part of the part of the network, if you will, to get their inc ideas incubated and also launched. I think part of it is having the framework for individuals who have cash. So whether they're domestic um, Nigerians who have wealth and want to put money in, but having given them one the awareness of who's out there, the framework of what investment is. It also means even as an SME or a business owner, typically when you have a VC put in funds obviously they want a return. And so there's also the understanding of the VC is not just giving you money to get a return back at some point. They also want to help you in operating and helping you expand and also being part of whatever vision you have or even adapting that vision. So there's comfort needed on both ends and a, 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 um, almost a, a level of maturity, if you will, needed. And I sort of shared um, Tayo's view on it's an evolution for us. Um, I definitely think the opportunity is there. You need a framework. You need both the entrepreneurs to understand what it means to have a VC invest, um, but you also need for those who have the money to see those opportunities and be there at every step of the way in order to then harness the returns, whether for them individually or even for a better Nigeria. Um, but the bank, um, personally, if I speak about Union Bank, clearly recognizes that from a startup perspective, SMEs, it's the future of Nigeria. Um, a lot of the conversations we're having, uh, both with CC Hub and with many across Nigeria, is listen, this bank has been around for 100 years. When you think about the next 100, you can't talk about the future without thinking about uh, SMEs, given whether it's access to credit, access to funds, um, access to know-how and, and technology, all of those are part of the equation. Um, but it, we can't do all of this without partnerships. So even though you're being hard on the banks, <laughs> the banks acknowledge, and, and if not all, I can at least speak to, to Union Bank, acknowledge that there is no way we'll be having this conversation today or even in the future without acknowledging whether it's the regulators, the partners from a technology perspective, the customers and their needs, which are always going to be ever-changing. And we, also, we have to be able to anticipate those changes. Well, we look forward to the future. Amen. I think it's here already. It <laughs> Thank is. you so much Thank uh, you. for joining us today. On that note, we've come to the end of a panel discussion on the evolution of financial supermarkets. My guests have been Tayo Viosu, CEO of Paga, Kola Oni, the head of strategy, marketing, and planning at AXA Mansard, and Lola Cardoso is the head of group corporate strategy at Union Bank. And I'm Wolif Amira, thanking you for watching.